不留，出价就卖。内湖店民权东路六段八号二七九一三三八八，三重店重新路五段六百五十七号二九九九九九三三。We're in a bit of a, a period time machine here. In the age of the machine, every decade is defined by its engineering masterpieces. So join me on a journey through time as I experience the great machines that changed people's lives and shaped modern Britain. The 1950s were, in my view, a great time to be British. Oh, yes. We were picking up the pieces from the Second World War and building a brave new nation. ID cards were consigned to the past. Rationing came to an end. Ah, tea with milk and sugar, glorious. And we had a lovely new young queen. But despite victory in the war, the Great British Empire was coming to an end. With new superpowers to the east and west threatening our peace and prosperity. And it was up to Britain's engineers to design and build the machines that would secure our future. In a new world order. Ah, 1950s London town. A city on the move, or not, as the case may be. Oh, do come along, get a move on. There's one thing that bothers me about driving in London, it's the congestion. The 50s saw car ownership double, and city streets became more jammed than ever. So London Transport decided to build a new, modern bus to entice Londoners back onto public transport. And this is it. This is an AEC Routemaster, probably the most famous public service vehicle of all time. An enduring icon of London. A machine that was designed to last little more than a decade, but thanks to its great design, ruled the streets for nearly 50 years. So, how could such a brilliant and futuristic machine have been produced at a time of such massive national debt? It all began with one of London Transport's chief engineers, Albert Durrant, whose ambition far exceeded what he was actually asked to build. Durrant's task was to build a bus that would carry more passengers for less fuel than existing motor buses. He was also determined to build a bus that was safer and easier to drive while matching the comfort levels of the current range of Austin and Morris cars. So, how did he plan to achieve this miracle? Using war technology. Bombers, to be precise. During the war, Durrant had witnessed mass production of Halifax bombers in the London Transport Bus Factory. Bombers had to be fast, strong and light. So they used loads of this stuff, aluminium, attached to lightweight frames. So Durrant decided to build his new bus like a Halifax bomber. Taking the basic shape and design of an existing bus, the RT, and radically reworking it. So the RT has a separate chassis and a body built on top. The chassis supports everything. The RT chassis and running gear weighed a massive three and three quarter tons. If Durrant could lose some of that weight, his new bus could carry far more passengers. If you do away with the chassis, the body has to be much more rigid because not only does it have to support itself, it has to support everything else. The engine, the gearbox, the steering, the suspension, everything. 
Like an aircraft, Durant gave his Routemaster a rigid, lightweight frame, called a monocoque, onto which the aluminium panels were mounted. With no heavy chassis under here, the Routemaster could carry 15% more passengers than the RT for the same overall weight. Very clever. With his economical goal achieved, the Routemaster hit the streets in February 1956. And all the other elements that made this bus a masterpiece were unveiled. A dream about to be fulfilled. Yes. When you get behind the wheel, it's hard to believe this is a 50-year-old design. I'm really enjoying it. You, you really do feel quite something when you're driving a Routemaster. And that's because Durrant made it a whole lot easier and safer to drive than any bus before. Using the latest car technology from an automatic gearbox to power steering. Power steering is absolutely wonderful. If this was uh, unpowered steering, I think you'd build some arm muscles that you didn't know you had. For the passengers, like this odd fellow, it had softer suspension, big windows, built-in heating. You could even smoke in those days. Durrant really took his goal of enticing people back onto the buses very seriously. But there was one crucial test that would really show whether Durrant had nailed the perfect bus. A test that every new driver had to perform before they took to the streets. No problem there. Well done, Mr. Durrant. Well, you didn't really think they'd let me do that, did you? A truly great British machine. With a body like an aircraft, the handling of a car, and all the latest mod cons, the Routemaster was a bussing revelation. In the early 50s, this was a nation hungry for change. Churchill returned to power, promising a new era of freedom. Wartime bomb sites were being rebuilt. Modernism was back in vogue in architecture, fashion, and design. It was out with the old and in with the new. Though sometimes all these changes weren't entirely thought through. For over a hundred years, Britain had boasted the finest railway system and the greatest, fastest steam locomotives in the world. But in the 50s, some bright spark decided to chuck them all out. You want to make a little bit of extra money? Free flight, free hotel room. I went through checks, customs, dog sniffers. This is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. 转推前变成闯大祸的真人真事，全新系列异乡历劫。今晚十一点，国家地理频道。亚太电信快乐通，到大陆不必换门号，两岸漫游一码通。在上海打北京，一分钟多少钱？只要二点五元。广州打杭州呢？也是二点五元。厦门打西安呢？还是二点五元。到大陆讲手机，谁比亚太更便宜？打回台湾，每分钟也只要五块钱。亚太电信为你省更多。神兽小黄鸡全新上市 ，F 六三九也只要三七九零元哦。所以今麦上好吼，就是这个喜乐年年。喜乐年年，这喜乐年年吼是优交的还本终身保险，有身故保险金、完全残废保险金，够上重要。生存保险金，生存保险金，我来毛钱汤了。当然蛮有，咱若保险吼，当年拢还保个十八。保险代表，佮提高到二十八。二十八。每年哦，话愈保险愈侪啦，恁即几个哦，趁少年紧去保保啦。邮政简易人寿，喜乐年年，还本终身保险。有交保险，上保险。纯爱荡漾，香气奔放。
品味丰富盎然。Johnny Walker 绿牌十五年。어서오세요无穷乐趣，要是能有翻身术就好了。首尔的乐趣，怎会有尽头呢？无穷乐趣，尽在首尔。小时候，父亲的一句梦话，让我立即要帮助更多的人在工作上找到一个归宿。同时，我也见证到很多的幸福。一路走来，别人做不到的，就业服务中心都做到了。你不要心急，啊，那就丢啊啦。老哥，百兰氏续配险金买这么多是怎样啊？这个百兰氏续配险金厉害，你看我的肝指数全都降下来了。难怪你现在气色这么好。<笑>当然，它是险金里面唯一唯一的哦。经过实验证实，有效降低血清中 GOT、GPD 值，就很有效啊。啊，喝险金不就是为了要保肝？险金唯一认证，护肝才有保证。百兰氏续配险金，更多成功见证，请上网搜寻护肝见证。In the mid 1950s, the British Transport Commission decided to do away with old-fashioned steam, believing the clean, efficient future for trains was electrification. Electrification sounds great in theory, but it would have meant installing overhead wires or an electric third rail across Britain's 30,000 or so kilometre rail network at a vast cost the country simply couldn't afford. So the diesel engine was called in as a short-term stopgap. The problem was that existing diesels were good for shunting, but far too slow for passenger trains. We needed more power, and we got it from a rather unlikely source, the Admiralty. That's right, Britain's best plan to replace steam was to build a locomotive with a boat engine. Brilliant. The engine was the Napier Deltic, originally designed for the Navy's fast attack craft. I've come to the Deltic Preservation Society at Barrow Hill near Chesterfield. To find out how it evolved into one of the most extraordinary engines ever built. Here we have a relatively standard six-cylinder diesel engine with a heavy lump on top. This is the cylinder head, and it seals in the huge pressure generated by the igniting fuel-air mixture. If you take the cylinders and turn them to face each other, you don't need a heavy lump on top. It's called an opposed piston engine. Napier's first version, the Culverin, had six cylinders, each with two pistons. So, as the two pistons come together, they compress the air to such a high temperature that when diesel is injected here, it burns and fires the two pistons apart, turning two crankshafts. It gives a much greater power-to-weight ratio than a conventional diesel engine. But the Admiralty wanted even more power with the least possible weight. So Napier got even more creative. With a crazy design that linked three six-cylinder opposed piston engines together in a triangular or deltic design, one in here, two, three. So now we have 36 pistons, but only 18 cylinders driving three crankshafts. Again, no cylinder heads required. Madness or genius? The new 18-cylinder turbocharged Deltic boasted 3,100 horsepower, doubling the power-to-weight ratio of its rivals. Great for the Navy's high-speed boats, and just maybe it could solve the problem of replacing steam with a fast, powerful diesel locomotive. 
In the late 50s, Napier's parent company, English Electric, unveiled their Deltic-powered prototype, the DP-1. This British Rail Class 55 locomotive is the production version. And right now, I'm going to have the opportunity to drive this icon of British engineering. I'll be under the expert tuition of Mike Hallam Rudd, who spent nearly three decades preserving Deltic locos. Oh, yes. The engines are nearly 50 years old, so Mike's kindly letting me prime the oil. 80 strokes on that pump, and that's, that's adequate to do it. So while you do that, I'm going for a cup of tea. 80 strokes on the... OK, I'll see you next year, then. That's one stroke. That's two strokes. Oh, gee. That's a lot 38, 39, 40. Oh. 73, 74, 75. I won't have any strength to drive the actual thing. <laughs> OK, Chris, that'll do fine, thank you. Great. <laughs> Finally, the moment of truth. around to engine only, locomotive brake on, train brake to running. Okay. You're now ready to run. I'm ready to go. Into forward. Eight miles an hour, ten miles an hour. Six tons on the move here. Just a little bit of juice, that's all we gave it. The magnificent Deltics gave Britain its first regular 100 mile per hour diesel passenger service. Effortlessly slashing an hour off the run from London to Edinburgh. Move over steam. Looks like diesel's here to stay. For me, the Class 55 was a true concord of the railway system. Eventually, the brilliant Deltic was replaced by improved conventional diesel locos. But this masterpiece of British ingenuity saved the railways in their time of need and changed the course of transport history. Even today, 60% of our railway network still uses diesel locomotives. Thanks to those incredible engines, Diesels were clearly no short-term stopgap. Using wartime technology, Britain's engineers got Britain back on the move in style. There was even a diesel-powered Flying Scotsman. And whether by road or rail, the British holiday reached an all-time high. Bogner, Butlins, Heidi High. But over the new spirit of the times fell a shadow of fear. The fear of nuclear war. The balance of power was changing, and the British people looked to their politicians and their engineers to secure them a place in a new world order. Just south of Manchester, in October 1957, at a place called Jodrell Bank, an engineering icon unlike anything seen before in Britain was being built and was about to give us a central role in the Cold War. This amazing structure was the realisation of one man's dreams. It was another brilliant reinvention of war technology for peaceful and scientific goals. During World War II, physicist Bernard Lovell helped pioneer airborne radar, allowing bomber crews to detect their targets in the dead of night with radio waves. After the war, Lovell turned his expertise with radio waves to a much more peaceful use, astronomy. 
He raised nearly £300,000 in government grants, over £3 million in today's money, to build the largest and greatest radio telescope in the world. A fantastic, ambitious machine designed to uncover the mysteries of the universe. It's the size of the Albert Hall. With more than 7,000 steel panels, the telescope weighs over 3,000 tons. Ten electric motors aim the dish towards any point in the sky to track distant cosmic objects with extreme precision. The whole amazing structure works like a giant radio set. Welcome to Hancock's Half Hour. A pint? Why, that's very nearly an armful. Radios receive invisible radio waves from nearby transmitters and decode them into sound. Lovell's dish picks up radio waves too, but the signals it receives have travelled from cosmic objects millions or billions of light years away. By the time they reach Earth, they need a giant dish to catch them before they're decoded into astronomical images. With a radio telescope, astronomers can see objects that are invisible to an optical telescope. And over the last 50 years, Lovell's telescope has made hundreds of important astronomical discoveries, including quasars, contributing to our knowledge of the universe. But in the mid-1950s, before the dish was even complete, the British military decided they had a more important use for it and insisted that Lovell convert it into a giant radar that could warn them of incoming Soviet bomber or missile attacks. Making these top secret changes put Lovell's construction disastrously over budget and in big trouble with his financiers. The Public Accounts Committee, unaware of Lovell's secret mission, threatened to lock him up. Lovell knew he needed a miracle to save the project and himself. That miracle arrived on October the 4th, 1957. Hello? The Russians have launched what? I'll get onto it straight away. The USSR had launched a 23-inch diameter machine called Sputnik, the world's first satellite. The space race had begun. Sputnik was harmless in itself, transmitting a radio signal back to Earth with information about the temperature and pressure of its surroundings for Soviet scientists to study. Anyone in theory could pick up Sputnik's signal with one of these newfangled transistor radios. Just get the right frequency and you could hear Sputnik bleep from space 500 miles above. But the missile that launched Sputnik was far from harmless and much harder to track. Sir Bernard Lovell, who still works here more than 50 years on, recalls the dramatic events of October 1957. This man in the Air Ministry has, has phoned me and said, that telescope of yours, do you realize that there, we have nothing in England and there is nothing in the West that can detect the carrier rocket which is placed put against space because the carrier rocket is a ballistic weapon. A ballistic missile would allow the Soviets to launch a nuclear strike anywhere on the planet. So Britain needed the dish to track the rocket. But the dish wasn't ready. Enormous emergency within a matter of days we first of all got the telescope working from the control system in this room and then obtained a, 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 a memorable echo from, yes. uh, from the Sputnik right. moving at 17,000 miles an hour over the Lake District. The Sputnik saved us. Overnight, Lovell's dish became a national sensation and a vital piece of Britain's Cold War defences as our early warning system against a nuclear attack. 
I mean, a single radio telescope like that, despite its massive size, actually has quite a blurry view. Um, it's looking at a patch of sky, maybe something like the size of the full moon. The crucial thing was that we knew where those launch stations were, we knew where the Russians had those missiles, and so this telescope was able to point towards that direction and look for a, a rocket coming up, look for an echo from that rocket as it, as it was launched. Lovell's telescope proved itself to be a truly great British machine, both in the Cold War and in the years of peaceful astronomy since. But searching for signals from outer space wasn't enough for the superpowers of the 50s. Oh no, they were intent on playing an insane Cold War game. The theory went that if the Soviets launched a nuclear attack, we would quickly detect it and launch a retaliatory attack of our own. The warheads would pass each other in mid-flight. The result would be a massive loss of life on both sides. It's called the theory of mutually assured destruction, or MAD. The hope was that this would prevent either side from launching an attack ever. It really was madness. For Britain to be a nuclear power, we needed the bomb, which we had, but also the means to deliver it, carrying it higher and further than any existing bomb to be dropped on Russian soil. Just that, British engineers came up with one of the most extraordinary aircraft the world had ever seen. Tutankhamen Tutankhamen's mummy is really one of the oddest mummies I've ever seen. Aijibi史上最有名的法老王竟然是被人草草下葬。it's really shocking. They should have been better prepared for his death. So Sanchong 但若只是用来讲电话那就太逊了一心打造格兰利威单一风味这也是乔治一一中爱格兰利威无二口感当乔治国王签下了这张单一无二的合法执照格兰利威自此定义了当今单一纯脉的风味为单一纯脉利威格兰利威单一无二都是你最爱的甜点跟咖啡耶 台湾大哥大G时代新推出i750超薄型Android手机 
台湾大哥大独卖 Samsung i 七五零零黑白双色，最低零元起。欢迎光临买放。哎，喝咖啡吃甜食又让你胃食道逆流了吗？还好。我随时都要准备。即位服饰定解决我的胃食道逆流，就给我即位服饰定。我的人生将由我自己掌握。老爸说，我满十八岁是大人了，要开始为自己的人生负责。我享受生活，享受美好，但我不会过自己的人生。我的生活由此刻崭新开始。享乐生活，负责人生。中华邮政 Visa 金融卡，刷卡满额现金回馈还能抽现金，汽油每公升降两元哦。哎，喝咖啡吃甜食又让你胃食道逆流了吗？还好，我随时都要准备。即位服饰定解决我的胃食道逆流，就给我即位服饰定。We've come to Bruntingthorpe Aerodrome, where a team of engineers are hard at work saving the last flight-worthy specimen of Britain's greatest Cold War bomber. To me, the Vulcan bomber says the future has landed 1950s style. It's like a spaceship from a Dan Dare comic book. It was built to play a deadly game of nuclear who dares wins, pointing east, ready to launch at a moment's notice to scare the Soviets from launching an attack. The brief was to design a bomber that could fly 10 miles above the ground to avoid enemy radar, while carrying a four and a half ton bomb to a target nearly 2,000 miles away. But pistons and propellers would never get the Vulcan to the high speed and altitude it depended on for success. It relied on another great World War II invention, the jet engine. Perfect for the Vulcan because it really comes into its own at high altitude. As you fly higher, the air becomes thinner and propellers struggle for grip. Most Second World War fighters hit the ceiling at around 35,000 feet. Jet thrust comes from high-speed gases being forced out of the back, allowing jet aircraft to fly much higher without the losing grip problem. In the thinner air, drag on your aircraft is greatly reduced, which means you can go a lot faster and burn less fuel. Jet engines made possible a vastly different breed of aircraft. In 1947, Roy Chadwick, the brains behind the hugely successful World War II Lancaster bomber, sketched a radical new design to meet the government's requirements for a nuclear bomber. Chadwick's first draft looked something like this. A pure triangular or delta wing with engines built into the wings and originally no tail at all. Sadly, Chadwick died shortly after completing his famous sketch, but his idea stuck, and the Avro company, who built the Lancaster, pushed on with the project. In 1952, Avro started flight testing their giant flying wing, the Type 698, with pilot Roly Falk at the controls. The Vulcan was a step into the unknown. There were no sophisticated monitoring devices. They simply used a cine camera to record data from the flight controls. The team spent four years perfecting the Delta Wing technology until the Vulcan was ready for active service. The B-1, as it was known, had four Olympus jet engines generating roughly three times more power than the best piston engines at the time. The swept back wings allowed the Vulcan to fly at over 500 miles an hour. The massive wings generated plenty of lift to carry the Vulcan and its bomb load up to 50,000 feet 
out of reach of enemy radar. The design was a huge success. A thrilling, fearsome symbol of Britain's nuclear deterrent. Now, I can't actually fly in this great aircraft because the Vulcan doesn't carry passengers. However, I'm extremely privileged to be able to witness the final few stages before getting this magnificent aircraft back into the air. Taft Stone is chief engineer of the team dedicated to preserving this piece of Britain's heritage. All right, Taft. Very well, thanks. So, Taff, what was the idea behind today? Uh, what we're doing today is the anti-deterioration checks. Uh, basically, every 28 days, we've got to run the engines, fire up all the flying controls, and basically just make sure everything's working, uh, working well. So, Taff, the last remaining flying Vulcan coming to work on this legendary machine every day must be more of a calling than a job. It is. It's such an iconic aircraft, and it's, it's basic engineering. It's not your little black boxes telling you what to do. you actually got to know the aircraft and treat it well. Engine start master set to one. Engine start master one. Taff is going to be running the engines one at a time. Set to one. JP limiter set to switch on. Position. Okay, then we go on for start on number four. Depending on the weather conditions, we may get what's known as a Vulcan howl. It's a unique sound. and 600 pounds of thrust shaking my very foundations. That was quite a howl, yeah. I mean, standing there, you, you could feel your whole body vibrating. You know, it's like the whole earth sort of shaking away through the body. You know, your rib cage is about to sort of disintegrate, you know. Say, with all four going, it must be just something else. Fabulous experience, really was. From 1956 to 1969, RAF Vulcans were kept on constant alert, ready to be scrambled at the first sign of an incoming Soviet attack. It was a tense waiting game. Thankfully, they never dropped a nuclear bomb and were eventually replaced by nuclear-powered submarines. They did, however, see non-nuclear action in the South Atlantic. During the 1982 Falklands conflict, the Vulcan carried out what was at the time the longest bombing raid in history, 8,000 miles over 16 hours. The Vulcan, despite being nearly three decades old, was the only RAF machine up to the job. A fitting swan song for such a great machine. The Vulcan helped give Britain a say in Cold War politics, at a cost of tens of millions of pounds to the taxpayer. But meanwhile, a completely separate group of aviation pioneers had been developing an aircraft that could make the country millions. In a highly lucrative international business. London Tower, this is Yoke Peter requesting permission for takeoff. Over. Ah, yes, Peter, you're cleared for takeoff. Over. Just after three o'clock in the afternoon of May the 2nd, 1952, something totally extraordinary happened. Britain started a revolution as the first ever civilian passengers took to the air in a jet aircraft. The visionary behind this aircraft had just given his nation a huge head start in what was fast becoming a multi-million pound global business, international air travel. 
Geoffrey de Havilland was one of Britain's greatest aviation pioneers. Known for his belief that if it didn't look right, it wasn't right, he designed and built some of Britain's finest aircraft. In the late 40s, he gave the tough job of designing the world's first jet airliner to Ronald Bishop. The man behind the brilliant de Havilland Mosquito Bomber, one of Britain's most vital wartime aircraft. Bishop's next challenge was to design an aircraft that would fly higher, faster and further than the best piston-engine, propeller-driven airliners ever built. And this is a development model of what went on to become the Comet. The Comet, like the Vulcan a few years later, would use jet engines buried in the wing roots, flying at high altitude where reduced drag from the thin air improved speed and fuel economy. But in such thin air, passengers wouldn't be able to breathe and it would be rather cold. Bishop wanted his passengers to have a luxury experience, flying in comfort with unrivaled views through large square windows. But you could hardly expect them to wear heated military-style flight suits and oxygen masks. So the Comet would be built with a pressurized cabin. But that was a tough engineering challenge. The airliner is like a reverse submarine. Go too deep in a submarine and you could be crushed. Go too high in a pressurized aeroplane and you could explode. At the intended 40,000 feet altitude, the comet's lightweight aluminium skin would be stretched from the inside like a giant balloon. So Bishop had to design an aircraft strong enough to withstand the pressure, yet light enough to reach high altitude with the power that was available. The ghost engines Bishop had at his disposal each produced about 5,000 pounds of thrust. 50% more than rival piston engines, but only 10% of the thrust of a modern jumbo jet. The Comet, with these engines, would struggle to reach its target cruising altitude of 40,000 feet. So the fuselage skin was made as thin as was considered safe. The Comet's design was a careful balance between power, weight, strength and safety. It would be flying in a realm that was untested and unknown to passenger aircraft. But, contrary to popular myth, the Comet was extremely thoroughly tested before its maiden commercial flight. The 2nd of May, 1952. Worldwide success and vast potential profits all hung on this first flight. 36 paying passengers boarded Comet call sign Yoke Peter at London Airport, now known as Heathrow. London Tower, this is Yoke Peter requesting permission for takeoff. Over. Ah, Yoke Peter, you're clear for takeoff. Over. Just after 3 p.m., Comet Yoke Peter took off from London Heathrow bound for Johannesburg. Tickets cost £315 return, the same as for the less luxurious, slower piston-engined airliners. This is your captain speaking, ladies and gentlemen. We're now cruising at a speed of 500 miles an hour at an altitude of 40,000 feet. Beat that piston-engined aircraft. The jet age had begun, with Britain at the helm. Over the next two glorious years, airlines from around the globe placed orders for the Comet. A triumph for de Havilland and Britain on an international scale. American Aviation magazine went so far as to say, whether we like it or not, the British are giving the US a drubbing in jet transport. But then, Disaster struck. On the 10th of January 1954, a Comet flight from Rome plunged into the sea. Three months later, on April the 8th, the same happened to another Comet. 56 people lost their lives in the two crashes. The nation was in mourning.
Wreckage from the first crash was taken to the Royal Aircraft Establishment in Farnborough, where it was assembled piece by piece for examination. Investigators suspected what's known as explosive decompression, which is what happens when a pressurized container is pierced and rips itself apart. The wreckage showed no signs of a bomb blast, so the prime suspect had to be structural failure. To test their theory and save the future of the comet, investigators devised an extraordinary full-scale experiment on an intact comet. Testing the cabin with compressed air in the open air could destroy vital evidence pinpointing the exact location of the failure. So what the investigators did was they built a tank around a comet aircraft and then filled the hull of the comet and the tank full of water. They hoped that if the fuselage failed, the water would contain the damage. Like so. Allowing them to accurately pinpoint the source of the problem. By July 1954, the investigators had their culprit. This fantastic aircraft was foiled by one tiny and seemingly insignificant detail, the square shape of the windows. This increased stress levels in the skin at the corner, speeding up metal fatigue. Under the high stresses, tiny cracks on the edges of the rivet holes grew, eventually leading to a catastrophic failure and explosive decompression. For the comet as a machine, the cure was straightforward. A thicker, stronger skin, rounded windows and improved engines to carry the extra weight. But for the comet as a commercial airliner, it was already too late. The time lost fixing it handed the Americans the lead in commercial jet aviation. We never won it back. The de Havilland Comet was a great trailblazer. Sadly, it blazed a trail that others alone would follow. And it was not the solution to Britain's economic woes. But solutions were found. You get tunnel vision, and if you keep pulling G and don't strain against it, that tunnel vision just becomes totally black. It's when there's a lapse in concentration that things can go wrong. 全新系列危险讨生活，星期二晚上九点，国家地理频道。他没吃到这辈子第一个冰淇淋，他没和初恋情人结婚，儿子帮他开的冰店后来收掉了，他最后没能健康的走出医院。人的一生有很多事不能如愿，但晚安生命却帮我们实现人生最后一个梦想。想要的方式道别，万安生命。所以今麦上好吼，就是这个喜乐年年啦。喜乐年年，这喜乐年年吼，是优交的还本终身保险，有身故保险金、完全残废保险金，够上重要的生存保险金。生存保险金，我来冒钱通了。当然嘛有，咱的保险吼，逐年拢还保下十趴。保险来代表，佮提高到二十趴。二十趴。每年吼，话愈久领愈侪啦，年纪过年吼，叹笑咧，紧去补补咧。邮政简易人寿，喜乐年年，还本终身保险。有保险，上保险。In the mountains of Sancha, beauty is forever on display. Take a moment to look, smell, and listen to what nature has to offer. right outside your doorstep. Get closer with nature.
right here in Sancha.保护健康善存麦当劳三层牛肉鸡翅堡1950s, there was one great machine that for me, more than any other, was the shining example of the engineering of the era. Born of post-war ingenuity and materials, it helped rebuild Britain by taking the world by storm. Half car, half tractor, it was designed for farmers the world over, but has been used with a passion by everyone from royalty to extreme explorers. It was, of course, the Land Rover. Marketed as the farmer's friend, it was built using post-war leftovers, a marriage of ingenuity and necessity designed as a short-term quick fix for an ailing British car company. So how did a hurriedly improvised post-war stopgap become an international success? And in my humble opinion, the greatest British workhorse ever built. In the years following World War II, factories struggled from ongoing shortages of all sorts of raw materials, including steel. One company that was seriously feeling the post-war pinch was Rover, which was famous for making prestige cars like this P3. Now this P3 is made mainly out of steel, Steel was scarce, and Rover couldn't physically make enough P3s to survive. Steel was only allocated to companies that exported their products. Rover didn't. So they needed to come up with a machine to sell overseas. It just so happened that Rover's technical director, Morris Wilkes, was using a war surplus US Army Willys Jeep to get around his holiday home on Anglesey. Although Wilkes hated to admit it, the American's ingenious four-wheel drive Jeep was brilliant for odd jobs on rough ground and much faster than dragging out a tractor. But spare Jeep parts were becoming hard to get hold of. One Easter, while on holiday, Wilkes had a brainwave. Why not design his own version of the Jeep for Rover to build and sell overseas? He sketched his idea in the sand for his brother Spencer, who happened to be managing director of Rover. It was unlike anything Rover had ever built before, but Spencer was sold, so they trundled off to Rover HQ to present the idea to the board. This is block one of what was then Rover's Solihull factory, where the Wilkes brothers had their offices.
I'm here to ask Land Rover historian Roger Craythorn just how easy it was for them to persuade the board. But this was a, a total departure, really, from, from the manufacturer of prestige cars, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And the company very quickly realised that they needed to do something to create export orders. And um, they tried to replicate the Jeep, but not as a military vehicle, more of a vehicle for the farming community. So there you have the ideal vehicle to sort of move the hay bales and the milk churns during the day and then um, take the wife out to the theatre of an evening. The Wilkes brothers also realised that a lightweight 4x4 would be ideal for the rough roads of the Commonwealth. This just might be the export market Rover was looking for. But their new machine would have to be extremely tough and reliable in the worst imaginable conditions. While many cars and even the Routemaster bus were switching to monocoque designs, Wilkes stuck with a tough steel ladder chassis frame. But Rover didn't have enough steel to make the rest of the bodywork. So Wilkes turned to a material that was sitting around in plentiful stockpiles after the war. Yes, you've guessed it. Aluminium again. Mostly flat panels with a minimum of shaping, nice and easy to make. And you can bash it around, dent it, scratch it. It won't rust. An inspired feature was what they called the power takeoff, with which you could drive all sorts of different tools with the Landy's engine. Great for odd jobs around the farm, no tractor required. The design was full of good ideas, but the machine was built almost entirely from existing Rover stocks. Even the engine was straight out of the P3 saloon. So at best, the Rover board was hoping the new machine would get them through the post-war slump. Oh, how wrong they were. They obviously didn't spend enough time. Out here. All the way down. Now, how cool does that look with the windscreen down? Yes. Bit of wind in the old face. And probably some mud as well. We have contact. And we're away. Welcome to the jungle. This is the original jungle track, where Wilkes put early Land Rovers through their paces. It's right next to the Solihull factory where they were built. This is the stuff. Thanks to that combination of heavy steel chassis and lightweight aluminium body, the Land Rover has a low center of gravity that should make it impossible to topple over. This is what Land Rovering is all about. Getting in the muddy lanes, through the puddles. Ah, we've got a little bit of a slope here, boys, so hang on tight. It's the kind of thing you never think a, a Land Rover's going to do it, but it does. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very impressive indeed. Within months of its release, the Land Rover was outselling Rover's road cars, at home and in the Commonwealth a great British icon that has stood the test of time. The Land Rover and many other brilliant machines of the 50s helped put Britain back on her feet. By the end of the decade, the average weekly wage had almost doubled, and new Prime Minister Harold Macmillan was moved to say that the people had never had it so good. It was the dawn of a new era of prosperity, inventiveness and cultural revolution in a country that had found its place in the new world order. Shop 
五搜购周年庆，十月八日至十月十九日，全馆八折起，超市九折，天母店独家回馈，满五千送五百，还有家电生活用品超值满额送，天母搜购周年庆 ，Let's go。少买 LV， 十五分钟约会一零一，每平不到二十万，轻松住东区。爱上戏纸，一次购足，轻松住微风小城八六。